Okay, so um, a little bit of review to get us started because we're going from you know one step. It's kind of a continuation. So last time we talked about glycolysis. What are the reactants and products of each? So I want you to fill this out yourself or with your buddy to the left or right, front or behind of you. What are the reactants and what are the product products? And in glycolysis, every reactant has a corresponding product to it. So imagine this was a quiz right now. How well would you do? Okay, did you guys get them all? <coughs> okay, how many reactants did you have? Three. Three? Okay, so let's, what's the biggest one? Glucose. Glucose. Right, and it becomes? Pyruvate. Pyruvate. Oop, no, that's a horrible Y. Okay, what's another reactant? Good, NAD plus, which becomes? ADH. Okay, and then what's the other one? ATP. ADP. What does the D stand for? Dye, which means there's two phosphates. And what does it become? Triphosphate. ATP triphosphate. So you're adding a phosphate. Okay, good. So. Which um, of these are exergonic and which of these are endergonic? Talk to your neighbor. One is exergonic. Okay, which ones? <laughs> Your question? Okay, glucose has how many carbons? Six. Six carbons, yes. Pyruvate has how many carbons? And there's two of them, so you still have the same amount of carbons, but they aren't bound together. So what happened to those bonds? It gave off energy, so this must be exergonic. Okay, all right, what about NAD plus to NADH? That is endergonic. Okay, why is it endergonic? Because it has some energy. Yes, it absorbed energy, and with that energy, it formed another bond to hydrogen. Okay, and we already said um, ADP had two phosphates, and ATP has three phosphates. <coughs> So you made another bond. You had to have energy in order to do that. So this must be what? Yeah. Endergonic. Where did the energy come from to make that NADH, that ATP? Where did the energy, if you have to have energy input to add that hydrogen and that phosphate. Exactly. So. Glucose gave off energy as it became pyruvate. That energy was used to add a hydrogen and to add a phosphate to ADP and ATP. Okay, good. So at the end of this, ATP is ready to be used for energy. NADH has some potential energy, which we'll use later. And now we have pyruvate. And we're going to keep on using pyruvate and break it down further to make more energy. So that's our next step. Yes. Okay, so pyruvate oxidation, um, what we have is pyruvate becoming acetyl CoA. So, how many carbons were in pyruvate? Three, Three carbons. Um, and there are two carbons in acetyl-CoA. So what happened to that other carbon? Okay, yeah, it was released 
as carbon dioxide. And what can we use carbon dioxide for in the cell or in the body? Nothing, Nothing right? This is waste. What do, we, what do we do with carbon dioxide in our body? Yeah, we breathe it out. So that's why you breathe out carbon dioxide. There's nothing you can do with it. <laughs> so we let it go. Okay? So um, that's where the third carbon went. Um, but co uh, let's see, acetyl is two carbons. CoA is another um, molecule in and of itself that you bound there. So in order to get this, you have to have CoA to bind to the acetyl. Okay, and in this product uh, process, you also get what are we doing to that NAD plus? Reducing it, right? Adding a hydrogen to it. Was there a question? Yeah. Yeah. What is CoA? What does it stand for? Uh, coenzyme A, and we will we will look at the molecular structure on the worksheet. We'll talk about it. But okay, so what are the reactants and the products then of this reaction? Pyruvate. Good. What's another reactant? NAD plus. And there's one more. Coenzyme A. Okay. Then the product then is acetyl CoA or acetyl CoA and NADH, and then our CO2 waste. All right, so once again, we've got some potential energy in NADH, which we'll use later. We've got CO2 that's not going to be used for anything. It's just going to be diffused out of the cell. And now we've got a two-carbon sugar, S2-CoA, which we can use in the next step. Okay, so we're going to keep on using um, the products for the next step. Yeah. Okay, so the citric acid cycle has nine steps um, where each, at each step you have a carbon molecule changing into a different carbon molecule and an enzyme responsible for that change. To take biochemistry, you have to know all those steps and all the enzymes and the products and everything, the molecular formulas and the chemical structures of all of them, okay? Yeah, it will be fun. But we're not going to study it in that detail. Um, we're going to give some very basics. Well, we broke it up into three different parts. Okay. What did we have at the end of pyruvate oxidation? Okay, CO2, but that's not... Acetyl-CoA. Good. Acetyl, uh, Acetyl-CoA. And what were... And that's how many carbons? Two. Two carbons. And we're going to add acetyl-CoA to a molecule called, oops, oxaloacetate. Okay, and this is a big long word, lots of syllables. But you can say acetate, right? I guess you can. <laughs> All right, well, you can say acetate, and then it just has oxalo on the beginning. Oxaloacetate. Okay, there are four carbons in ox, uh, oxaloacetate, and then that combines acetyl-CoA to make <coughs> citrate. How many carbons do you think that has? Probably six. Correct. Okay, and then the coenzyme A is no longer needed. And so that's bumped off, and then you recycle it in pyruvate oxidation, so you can use that again. 
Okay, so the first step is The regeneration of citrate. Okay, so you take uh, oxaloacetate and acetyl CoA and you make our six carbon citrate. Okay? Um, the second step is. Excuse me. Why is it regeneration? Um, just a second, let me finish my thought. <laughs> Okay, so it's called regeneration because you're making it by combining two other things. So you need to make citrate in order to get all of your products, which we'll talk about in a second. So I have all those arrows there. Um, and so, I don't know why they call it regeneration, but yeah, you're just <laughs> reforming, bringing together, again, to make citrate. So the second step then is the decarboxylation of citrate. So what does that sound like you're doing to citrate? Taking off the carbons. Yeah, you're taking off the carbons. And what would be the form of those carbons? Good, right? So you have two carbon dioxides being produced as waste. And um, the... Um, the product of this is a, a four carbon molecule called succinate. Okay? So, in that process, you get two NAD pluses being reduced. I heard that. <laughs> you get one FAD plus. <laughs> um, it was inappropriate. All right, so, and it got recorded, so, bonus. <laughs> Yeah, I can go ahead and edit it, but I probably won't. All right, so FAD plus <laughs> is reduced into FADH2. And then you also get an ATP. It's probably good to have those arrows on there so you know what, what your products are. Okay, so... The last step then is you take succinate, which is a four carbon molecule, and you um, convert it back into oxaloacetate. And in that process, you get another NADH. All right, so what you have to know, you have to know the three major steps, okay? Not the nine steps in between. You have to know these four molecules, acetyl-CoA, citrate, succinate, oxaloacetate. And then you have to know the products in each of the steps, okay? Um, and that's, this is the simple form, okay? This is a great place to start once you get into biochemistry, and now you're going to talk about all the chemical structures and everything. Okay, so what, what, where we're at at this point then is we have all this potential energy. We have some ATP and we can then take those hydrogens and use them again in our final um, step which we'll talk about on Monday in the electron tra transport chain and chemiosmosis. Okay, but up to this point, what we're going to do next is I want you to go through and um, outline how many of each product you get. So we have carbon dioxide, ATP, NADH, and FADH2. 
Okay, and in glycolysis, we're starting with one molecule. We're breaking it down into two molecules. So you'll have to take that into consideration. And what I want you to do for the next few minutes is fill this out as best you can, based on the information we have. And then we'll go back and talk about it, okay? Okay, so let's start with the citric acid cycle. How many carbon dioxides were produced? Two, right? But for every, gly for every glucose molecule, we get two pyruvates, then we get two acetyl-CoA's, so it runs through twice. So you have to multiply it by two, so you actually got four. Good, so how many ATP's did you get then? Two. Right, one times two. How many NADH's? Six. Yeah, three times two. And how many FADH2s? Two. Good. So in citric acid cycle, you get at least uh, acid cycle. You get at least one of everything. Yes. So the citric acid cycle and pyroxidation cycle is always go through twice. Yes, because you started with two, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So how many carbon dioxides in pyruvate oxidation? Two. Two. How many ATPs? Two. None. How many NADHs? Two. two. How many FADH2s? Two. Zero. All right, we don't have any FADH2s in glycolysis either. Do we have any carbon dioxides? No. All right, and this one we don't multiply by two because we started with just one glucose. So how many ATPs? Two. And how many NADHs? Two. Good. All right, so one thing to point out here, how many carbon dioxides did we produce? Six. Six. How many carbons did we start with? Six, right? There are six carbons in glucose. We broke them all down into carbon dioxide, and then we got all the energy we could out of them. Um, so that makes sense that we would have six carbon dioxides at the end. And when you go back to the original equation, what's the original equation? C6H12. O6 plus O2 makes CO2 plus H2O. Okay, if you were to balance this, you would get six carbon dioxides. And in order to do that, you need six oxygen. But we'll talk about oxygen doesn't come in until the next step. So we'll talk about oxygen on Monday. Okay, any questions? <coughs> 